it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, but probably more than that, it's a great uh, honour to be here. Uh, this is my first visit to Hungary, and in one respect at least, that is more than a little surprising. Because um, Hungary has had an emotional claim on me probably ever since the age of 12, when my father uh, told me about his uh, first uh, and only contact with the United Nations when, in 1956, as a young worker in the aircraft factory in Belfast, he organised some colleagues to send a telegram to the General Secretary of the United Nations uh, appealing for uh, aid to the Hungarian <coughs> people. Uh, well, my father's first and last, uh, and I would say now predictably uh, unsuccessful contact with the United Nations has rather set the context for the beginning of my education in international affairs. But to go back to me at the age of 12, so at the age of 12, say 1975, um, i have been forming for myself certain views about uh, whether events were possible or utterly impracticable. Um, and if someone had said to me at the age of 12 that Hungary would one day, once again, be a free nation, I would have thought that as desirable as it were impossible, a bit like a Jacobite restoration in London. But I've since learned that, uh, quite apart from any question of divine providence, there is no such thing as historical inevitability. And even if it appeared to many people, including the 12-year-old me in 1975, that Hungary and other states were held irrevocably in Soviet occupation, Hungary was free by the second day of May, uh, 1990. Brexit is still not inevitable. But no more inevitable is the continued survival of the European Union, um, and you will, I am sure, detect some resonances of that context <coughs> in what I'm going to say about legal cooperation after Brexit. So, in this talk, I want to set out a proposition about international cooperation. I think a fairly straightforward proposition. And then I want to explore three complications uh, with that proposition. Um, now, given the, the Brexit uh, elements uh, of this talk, two of the complications have a specific uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland, UK interplay. The third complication has a much wider uh, European aspect and looks at the impact of the Court of Justice of the European Union on the ability of states to reach agreements with one another. As a purpose, do you think I need the amplification, or if I put this down, can you still hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, all right. Well, that's a, it's a bit more natural if, if I do it that way rather than hold that. Um, here's the, the straightforward proposition. Legal cooperation uh, between nations will not, indeed cannot, come to an end after Brexit. Friendly nations will continue to have relations with each other and will want to cooperate with each other and will often require to cast that cooperation in legal terms. I'm sorry, because of the streaming experience. Oh, I see. Just oh, not yeah. because of the people's uh, oh, well, that's good to know. Uh, so this is a requirement which possibly will be a more acute experience by nations that are not perhaps on the friendliest of terms. So bilateral and multilateral relations that have existed before the European Union, and I use this term as a shorthand for the Union and its uh, predecessors, um, will continue after the UK has left, assuming it does leave, uh, new relations will be formed and legal effects given to those new relations. Now, the first complication that I want to explore relates to the withdrawal agreement in its present form, but it will be recalled that there are three other connected texts. Firstly, the political declaration setting up the framework for the future relationship between the European Union and the UK. Second, the declaration by the UK on the operation of the democratic consent principle. And thirdly, the statement that political agreement has been reached and uh, that an agreement has been concluded on the article 52 TEU. 
So this first complication arises from a pre-existing bilateral arrangement, what has been called the common travel area between Ireland and the United Kingdom. Now to understand the common travel area properly, well we have to go back, well, centuries. So uh, let's not do that, but let's go no further back than 1949. In the Ireland Act, 1949, an act of the United Kingdom Parliament, section 1, subsection 1, recognised and declared that the Republic of Ireland ceased from April 1949 to be part of His Majesty's dominions. And section 2, 1 of that act, perhaps a little oddly in view of the preceding provision, also declared that the Republic of Ireland is not a foreign country for the purposes of any law in force in any part of the UK uh, or in any colony. Citizens of Ireland and citizens of the UK from that point onwards no longer had a common citizenship. But an Irish citizen in 1949 and now in the UK is not a foreigner. What of the status of a British citizen in Ireland? This is addressed in two acts of the Irish Parliament, the Immigration Act 2004 and the Immigration Act 1999. And these acts, acts of the Irish Parliament, make use of the concept not of foreigner, but of non-national. And the 1999 Act provides that non-national means an alien, or a, an old-fashioned term, within the meaning of the Act of 1935, the Aliens Act 1935, another Act of the Irish Parliament. Um, Section 3 of the Aliens Exemption Order 1999 exempts citizens of the UK from the application of the Aliens Act 1935. Now, there is a 2011 decision of the Dublin High Court uh, given by Mr Justice Hogan, who is now Advocate General Hogan in the Court of Justice of the European Union. And he said the effect of that was to exclude British citizens from the definition of non-national in the Immigration Act and by extension from the Immigration Act 2004. So uh, the decision uh, of Mr Justice Hogan in that case offers a useful analysis of the common travel area and he points out in that case that the common travel area is, this is a quotation, is for the benefit of two nationalities only, with no unified visa system which would allow third country nationals possessing such a visa on travel access to the two jurisdictions participating in the common travel area. So, to summarise, an Irish person then in England or Scotland or Wales is not regarded as a foreigner, but an English or a Scottish or a Welsh person in Ireland, that is the Republic of Ireland, is still an alien, but an alien to whom the Aliens Act 1935 does not apply, and he or she is not non-national. Um, parenthetically, the uh, ninth volume of documents on Irish foreign policy, published by the Royal Irish Academy, uh, covers the years 1948 to 1951, and is <coughs> an incredible resource for anyone interested in the issues of British and Irish nationality. What's striking too about a publication of that nature is that in the editorial uh, apparatus it's indicated that there will be redactions when this is required for the purposes of current diplomacy, among other things, and it's extraordinary the number of redactions that are still found in some of the reproduced documents. Now, let's go forward then to the, the Brexit documents. Section 9 of part two of the political declaration on the framework for the future relationship between the European Union and the UK is entitled mobility. Paragraph 49 provides that the mobility arrangements, when they are agreed, will be based on non-discrimination between the Union's member states and full reciprocity. So the UK cannot hope consistently with its undertaking there to, for example, offer terms of mobility to French citizens that are denied to, to German citizens or to Hungarian citizens. But by paragraph 54, uh, within the same part, it is said any provisions will be without prejudice to the common travel area arrangements as they apply between the UK and Ireland. But 
I think we're, we're entitled to ask, what will the common travel area arrangements be going forward? So, uh, Article 3 of the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, makes provision for the common travel area, and its two paragraphs are remarkable for their ambiguity. So, perhaps uh, such ambiguity is inescapable since the common travel area is itself something of an anomaly. Two member states of the EU have in place an arrangement which gives free movement advantages to each other citizens that are not given to the other citizens of the Union. So, Article 3, uh, Paragraph 1 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol consists of one sentence. The first part of it provides that the United Kingdom and Ireland may continue to make arrangements between themselves relating to the movement of persons between their territories. But the second appears to limit this, while fully respecting the rights of natural persons conferred by human law. Even the first part of the sentence making of Article 3.1 is ambiguous. At present, the CTA benefits and is designed to benefit the citizens of Ireland and the UK only. Are these the arrangements uh, of which Article 3.1 permits the continuation? Or does the reference to an unqualified movement of persons mean that the CTA is henceforth denuded of its British Irish distinctiveness? This question is not answered uh, by Article 3.2, at least not clearly. In Article 3.2, is pla in placing an obligation on the UK to ensure that the continuation of the common travel area does not affect the obligations of Ireland under EU law does seem directed towards a common travel area that is not limited to British and Irish citizens. Put bluntly, the common travel area has been an unchallenged anomaly, doubtless a necessary anomaly given the interconnectedness, historical and current, between the United Kingdom and Ireland, an anomaly that would be hard to defend uh, in terms of the EU prohibition and discrimination on the ground of nationality. And is it a paradox? Uh, I ask without answering uh, that it's only on the UK leaving the EU that the anomalous nature of the common travel area may be addressed. Can its anomalous nature be addressed without diluting the so-called red line of the UK on free movement? So I turn then to the second <coughs> complication for international cooperation. And this arises from a tension between an aspect of the Northern Ireland Constitutional Settlement, the internal Constitutional Settlement on one hand, and on the other, the felt imperatives of UK-EU relations. Part 5 of the Political Declaration, Forward Process, uh, in paragraph 136, contains an agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union that the Good Friday, or Belfast Agreement, uh, reached April 1998 by the UK government, the Irish government, and the other participants, must be protected in all its parts. And these sentiments are echoed in the fourth recital to the protocol. The Good Friday Agreement, or Belfast Agreement, should be protected in all its parts. And indeed, in Article 1.3 of the protocol, which provides, this protocol sets out arrangements necessary to address the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, to maintain the necessary conditions for continued north-south cooperation, and to avoid a hard border and to protect the 1998 agreement in all its dimensions. Not parts this time, but dimensions. Now, one of the important, um, no less contentious, but being very important, parts of the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, is Strand 1, Paragraph 5D, which provides that among the safeguards for democratic institutions in Northern Ireland will be the arrangements to ensure that key decisions, that's the phrase you use, key decisions will be taken on a cross-community basis. And cross-community is defined as meaning either an overall majority of members of the Assembly present and voting, plus internally a majority of nationalist voting, a majority of unionist voting, or uh, a majority voting uh, with 40%, with 60% majority rather, and 40% unionist and 40% nationalist. So there are two ways, either simple majority with concurrent majorities of unionist and nationalist, or 60% weighted overall majority, 40% unionist, 40% nationalist. 
Um, and this has been given effect domestically in a number of provisions of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, uh, notably section 42, subsection 1, which provides that where 30 members of the Assembly petition to that effect, a vote will be on a cross-community basis. Now, one might have thought that in the light of the political declaration and the provision cited from the protocol, that provision would be made to protect the centrality of cross-community voting. But, in fact, Article 18.2 of the protocol and the unilateral declaration provide for something other than key decision-making by cross-community vote. The, the drafting technique is a little unusual, but the ultimate result is clear. So Article 18.2 of the protocol doesn't internally provide for what the decision-making mechanism by the Assembly will be. This is done by a requirement, it's self-contained within 18.2, that the decision-making expressing democratic consent shall be reached strictly in accordance with the unilateral declaration concerning the operation of the uh, consent provision in the protocol. Now, this unilateral declaration might be considered either an instrument that falls within the terms of Article 31.2b of the Vienna Convention, that is an instrument made by one or more parties in connection with the conclusion of the treaty, or it may be, in fact, given the broad definition of treaty within Article 2 of the Vienna Convention as part of the treaty itself. Nonetheless, it's a strange drafting technique. Now, paragraph 3a of the Declaration provides for a vote to be held in the Assembly on a motion that Articles 5 to 10 of the Protocol that provides for customs, movement of goods, state aid, etc., to continue to apply in Northern Ireland. Subparagraph B provides that consent to be provided by the Northern Ireland Assembly if the majority of the members of the Assembly present in voting vote in favour of the motion. So it is a simple majoritarian provision. And there is an alternative decision making process, but in that also the decision making is simply majoritarian in the teeth of the um, various uh, obligations to maintain the Belfast Agreement in all its parts. The only possible role for cross-community voting is that it will uh, extend the period um, under which Articles 5 to 10 of the Protocol will apply in Northern Ireland. Now, three points, I think, can be made about this. First, uh, I don't think it can be a plausible argument uh, and that's not to say that someone won't try to make it, that in some way the um, various general statements about the importance of adhering to the Belfast Agreement and all its parts will in some way trump the specific content of Article 18.2 and the Declaration. Second, there is an obvious incoherence between the unqualified support for the Belfast Agreement in all its parts and Article 18.2 of the Protocol. Um, third, on the premise that uh, all those who agreed to these provisions cannot have been unaware of this incoherence, why, I think we can ask, was it thought proper to insert expressions of unqualified support for the Belfast Agreement in all its parts when cross-community decision-making, a central principle of the devolved settlement in Northern Ireland, was being replaced for the undoubtedly constitutionally important issue of the continued application of Articles 5 to 10 of the Protocol? Well, one possible answer is that the rhetorical force of the Belfast Agreement in all its parts is much greater than the more accurate phrase such as the Belfast Agreement in some or most of its parts. But, and this is again not to offer an answer, uh, but to throw out a question, um, is not the approach of, of doing what has been done um, in the protocol not rather redolent, I know lawyers often get a bad press, but um, is this not really redolent of the lawyer in the musical Chicago who asserts razzle dazzle him and they'll never catch wise. Third complication, uh, the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union. As we all know, the bedrock of international law founded on treaties is the principle pacta sunt servanda. 
This principle, which forms the heading to Article 26 of the Vienna Convention and is noted in the third recital, the preamble to that convention, as universally recognised, seems straightforward. When two states agree in a treaty that they will do X, the principle of pacta sunt servanda means that they do X unless there is an international law justification for not doing X. The application of this principle is much less straightforward when the same states agree that they will do X, but that X means whatever is to be determined to be X at any time in the future by someone other than the two states. For example, an independent person or a court. What happens if we were to agree to do X, but the third party, the person of the court, changes X to Z? So I'm going to give two examples of X having been turned to Z, uh, and the body that has turned X to Z is the Court of Justice of the European Union. And I want to look at two decisions of the EU, the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, the first from 2014, the second from 2019, and I will include a very brief coda on a second decision from 2019. So uh, opinion 213, uh, given on December um, 2014, deals with the question of whether the draft agreement providing for European Union accession to the European Convention on Human Rights is compatible with the EU treaties. The Court of Justice um, of the European Union concluded in Opinion 213 that this draft agreement was not compatible with the treaties. Can I just ask, has anyone read Opinion 213? It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable read as a, a case study in judicial nullification, and I, I commend it uh, to all of you interested in this area. Well, as is well known, the Luxembourg Court's decisions uh, are the product of a chamber consisting of an uneven number of judges, and the chamber must agree on the outcome. The Luxembourg Court gives a single judgment, there are no dissents or concurrences, and secrecy attends the confection of Luxembourg judgments. This is required indeed by Article 35 of Protocol 3 of the Lisbon Treaty. By way of contrast, the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, a court which gets a very bad uh, press sometimes, certainly in the British press, um, has a system whereby the judges of that court sitting in a case are unable to give concurring and dissenting judgments and the concurring or dissenting opinions are published along with the the main judgment. Now to understand uh, opinion 213 we need to look really at one very simple and clear provision I think of the uh, Treaty on European Union and this is article 6 uh, paragraph 2 of the treaty and it provides, the Union shall accede to the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Such accession uh, shall not affect the Union's competences as defined in the treaties. Now, the first sentence of that provides a clear and unqualified commitment to ECHR accession. While the second sentence, in my opinion, a strictly speaking, unnecessary sentence, seems designed to protect against any suggestion that a positive obligation under the Convention, the Strasbourg Convention, might result in the EU having to or being enabled to stray beyond its areas of competence. Now, one might be forgiven for thinking that unless there was something gratuitous or extravagant in the particular draft agreement on union accession to the Convention, that there would be very little scope for the CJEU to do anything else but give its plaquette to such an agreement. Of course, this view m underestimates, uh, very largely underestimates, the sheer ingenuity of the CJEU in protecting, to use the language of gangsters, its own patch. When the Commission sought the opinion uh, of the Court of Justice, um, the Commission argued that the draft accession agreement was compatible with the treaties. The Parliament and the European Council also argued that the draft accession agreement was compatible with the treaties uh, and the governments of all of the EU member states argued that it was compatible with the treaties, uh, as did the Advocate General. Now, it is of course logically possible for a court to disagree with all of the parties 
who are themselves in agreement, who are appearing before it. But when that happens, it is, I suggest, uh, indicative of something very unusual taking place. Opinion 213 is, uh, I fear, a veritable catalogue of errors, not all of which, given our time, I can explore here. But I'll point to four errors. Um, but I think one can safely go so far as to say that error is found virtually on every page of the judgment. Um, so, first error is the approach of the court to Article 6.2. The court's error lies in regarding the second sentence of Article 6.2, such accession shall not affect the Union's competences as defined in the treaties, as a condition, and not as a statement of reassurance or a simple limitation. You might think this isn't an error of substance, but it strikes me more as the kind of rhetorical softening up <coughs> that is administered to the reader of the opinion uh, to prepare him or her for what lies ahead. And the second error is found in paragraph 189 of the opinion. And paragraph 189 juxtaposes Article 53 of the Convention, which permits states to have a higher standard of human rights protection than that required by the Convention. And the court says that these provisions should be coordinated so that the power granted to member states by Article 53 of the ECHR is limited. Now, this passage ignores a key provision of the Charter, Article 52, Paragraph 3, which provides that insofar as this Charter contains rights which correspond to rights guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights, the meaning and scope of those rights shall be the same as those laid down by the said Convention. And that means that in the area of correspondence, which is very great, between the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Convention, the Convention already takes the interpretive lead. So that is so quite apart from any accession to the Convention, and the coordination looked for by the Court is therefore not only its own unjustified invention, but quite unnecessary. The passage also ignores that Article 53 of the Charter is itself a self-subordinating provision which expressly disclaims any restriction or adverse effect on human rights that are recognised by the constitutions of member states, union law, international law and international agreements. So, in paragraph 189, the Court has engaged in the perplexing exercise of looking for something that is not necessary and then attaching, to, uh, attaching an adverse consequence. Uh, when it unsurprisingly fails to find it. The third error is found in paragraph 194 of the judgment, and it says this, insofar as the ECHR would require a member state to check that another member state has observed fundamental rights, even though EU law imposes an obligation of mutual trust between those member states, accession is liable to upset the underlying balance of the EU and undermine the autonomy of EU law. Now, it's difficult to speak of this paragraph in measured terms. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the Convention does not require one member state to snoop on another state for the purpose of observing how well or how badly the snooped on state is observing the Convention. Of course, there's an obligation, rather a faculty, for one Convention state to bring proceedings against another Convention state. But that's quite different from a, a monitoring uh, process. And the Convention will not condemn State A for the acts of State B. What the Convention will do, for example, is condemn State A for sending, let's say, a vulnerable prisoner to State B where conditions are known to constitute a breach of, say, Article 3 of the Convention, the Prohibition on Torture. The fourth error, final error, you may be glad to hear, uh, relates to Protocol 16 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I have to say, the uh, Luxembourg Court's treatment of Protocol 16 is, is simply absurd. Protocol 16 of the Convention makes provision for advisory opinions. So the very highest court in a member state that is a, a member state of the Council of Europe, signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, can send a case to the Strasbourg Court and ask in simple terms, what do you, the Strasbourg Court, think about this? And the Strasbourg Court, if the conditions in Protocol 16 are satisfied, will render an advisory opinion. And it's been absolutely clear that the advisory opinion, if rendered, doesn't bind 
the National Referring Court, nor indeed will it bind the Strasbourg Court in future if the issue ever ends up before it as a concrete case. Now, the two points um, about paragraph 16 can be made very simply. Firstly, paragraph 16 formed no part of the accession document. So the EU would not have been signing up to paragraph 16. Nonetheless, paragraph 16 is one of the reasons why the Luxembourg court uh, rejects uh, the, the draft agreement. But let's consider the counterfactual. Let's suppose that protocol 16 had been before the Luxembourg court, that it was part of the draft accession agreement. It provided only for advisory opinions. It wasn't binding. Um, and therefore, it could have actually no juridical effect in the strict sense whatsoever. So this leaves the, the larger question, why did the Court of Justice decide opinion 213 as it did? Well, the real reason, I think, uh, is found in paragraph 181. This is not, paragraph 181 is not actually a... Um, a, a provision or passage in the judgment which, which appears on its face to determine anything, but it conveys uh, something, I think, of the flavour um, which directed the Luxembourg court in a particular way. This is what the court says in paragraph 181. Accordingly, the EU, like any other contracting party, would be subject to external control to ensure the observance of the rights and freedoms the EU would undertake to respect in accordance with Article 1 of the Convention. In that context, the EU and its institutions, including the Court of Justice, would be subject to the control mechanisms provided for by the ECHR and in particular to the decisions and judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, that seems to be the real reason, the scenario plainly considered nightmarish by the Luxembourg court, that in the area of the convention, that it would be subject to the interpretive lead uh, of the Strasbourg court. Now, it would be no business of the Strasbourg court, whether before or after accession, to see whether EU law, qua EU law, was being adhered to. That is, and would remain, even after accession, the business of the Luxembourg court. The sole business of the Strasbourg Court is to determine in any given application made to it whether or not there has been a breach of one or more provisions of the Convention. Um, in one of the earliest comments on the decision, uh, Professor Douglas Scott said this, the ECJ concluded, to the great surprise of many, that the accession agreement is not compatible with EU law. Indeed, it found so many obstacles with the agreement that it has now rendered accession very difficult, if not impossible. I think that's correct. The problem with opinion 213 is that it has rendered the discharge of a solemn treaty obligation to accede to the Convention, 6-2, impossible. It has bluntly turned X into Z. Now, the second example of X being turned into Z comes from uh, a decision in June this year, the Commission against Poland. This is an action uh, taken by the Commission under Article uh, uh, 258 TFEU for failure to fulfil treaty obligations and the asserted treaty breach was a breach of the second subparagraph in Article 19.1. Member states shall provide remedies sufficient to ensure effective legal protection in the fields covered by union law. The Commission had two complaints. The first was that Poland by lowering the retirement age of Supreme Court judges appointed to that court before the 3rd of April had violated the principle of uh, irremovability of judges, which constitutes an essential aspect of judicial independence. And the second complaint was that the conferral by Poland on the President of the Republic of the power to extend the active mandate of Supreme Court judges violates the principle of judicial independence because his decision is not based on any binding criteria nor subject to judicial review and thus entails an excessive margin of discretion, allowing him to exert influence on Supreme Court justices. Now, let's go back, please, to Article 19, TEU. Consider where it's placed. Article 19 forms part of Title 3, which is entitled Provisions on the Institutions. And this ought to inform the interpretation of all of the provisions, including 19, that fall within this title. 
Article 19, paragraph 1, deals with the Court of Justice of the European Union. The second uh, sentence of paragraph 19 needs to be seen, the second subparagraph, rather, of paragraph 19 needs to be seen in the context of the first, providing for the composition and task of the CJEU. The second sentence, read in its natural context of a provision dealing with the Court of Justice, would not, I think, have appeared to the representatives of the states who agreed that treaty provision to have conferred a jurisdiction on the EU to determine what states could or could not do with their domestic legal system. See, obviously, that there must be domestic remedies for breaches of fields covered by European Union law. Can it? Um, be really supposed that the representatives of the states who agreed Article 19 could reasonably have contemplated that they were giving the Court of Justice a power to pronounce on the retirement age of national judges. Now, I don't know nearly enough, in fact, I know nothing about the Polish legal system to offer an opinion on whether or not the changes in Polish law that came into effect in 2018 were wise or not. I note that the law which give rise to the Commission concerns and complaints was itself amended by the Polish legislature. Now, I could devote, uh, well, the next hour to uh, that judgment, but uh, that's not my task. I'll make three quick points about the judgment and a, a further point of what I think might be done about it. First, as a matter of logic, lowering the retirement age of judges so that a fixed Lower age is applicable to all judges beyond which they cannot serve, in itself has no impact on judicial independence. The retired judges are no longer serving judges, and whether they were as serving judges, good judges or bad judges or indifferent judges, no longer matters. The quality of the legal system, including its respect for judicial independence, will be measured by the elements of the legal system, including judges, who are actually in service not by those whose service has finished. Second, judicial independence, which properly understood is a healthy constitutional feature, is not textually required, I think, by the second subparagraph of Article 19.1 TEU. What is required is effective legal protection in the fields covered by union law. If a national legal system did not provide impartial judges, then there would be an absence of effective legal protection, an absence of fairness. Judicial impartiality does not depend on particular arrangements thought to secure judicial institutional independence. Litigants are, I suggest, in the main, rather indifferent to issues about judicial independence, but all litigants care very much, uh, and rightly, about judicial impartiality. Consider this. Consider a judge who is retained by the President of Poland after his or her retirement age. Now, one can see the argument that such a judge might be thought to desire such retention before the decision to retain is made, and one can imagine how speculation might exist about how that desire could affect judicial behavior. If I was a litigant in a case uh, against the President of Poland, I confess that I might be worried uh, about my prospects before a judge who wished to be retained uh, by the President. On the other hand, there might be very many cases in which no litigant would experience the least qualm in having a case in which such a judge participated. What matters in every case, I suggest, is whether or not a judge will be impartial. Thirdly, unless citizens of the Union wish to submit to govern by judges, it seems to me that there's a very strong argument for the restoration of Pacta Sunt Servanda through a treaty amendment which would empower member states to enter a reservation with respect to interpretations of union law, including treaty provisions, with which they disagreed. Such reservations would be effective as respects to the member state unless there was an objection to it from all other member states. This would not be the equivalent of the privilegia di non appellando that abounded in the Holy Roman Empire. The jurisdiction of the court would not on this proposal be excluded in limine, which was the effect of those privilegia, but it would stop the CJEU from telling member states that X did not mean Z, but meant, would, would, and that would henceforth be curtailed. Uh, the coda um, to that case is the very recent decision, um, November 19, uh, of the Court of Justice in a number of joint cases taken by Polish judges, 
and the decision in those cases has been apparently regarded by the Polish Justice Minister as a victory for the Polish government. But I'm not sure if this is entirely the right way of looking at this. Again, for three reasons. Firstly, the case is a reinforcement of the role of the CJEU in shaping national legal systems. Second, the test for determining whether or not a national, legal, uh, national court is independent and impartial is so broad as to open to judicial policy making. Third, the CJEU has again, but notably in this case, sought to make the Polish judiciary the instrument for the strengthening of the doctrine of the Court of Justice. So, the common element, I suggest, in the three complications that I've put out um, this evening um, is the current structure uh, of the EU. The EU is not itself a state, but it is a body with interests analogous to those of states, and this is hardly a dramatic proposition. The EU serves the interests of the EU, and sometimes, Opinion 213 is an example, the CJEU just serves the interests of the CJEU. Um, the EU, in its present form, acts as an obstacle to agreements freely reached between nation states. Again, another proposition that's hardly dramatic. Need this be so? Well, I've suggested that there is no such thing as historical inevitability. So this need not be so, and there is already in existence another model which shows us that it indeed need not be so. I hope appropriate to make this in, in, in such an historic uh, city as this. Close to 1,200 years ago, on February the 14th, 842, two brothers met with their separate armies in Kivitate qui olum argentaria vocabatur nunc autem Strasbourg valgo de Keter. These brothers were two of the sons of the late Emperor Louis the Pious, known to us as Louis the German and Charles the Bald. What is particularly remarkable in this meeting, uh, apart from the fact they were ganging up on their, their brother, um, is the exchange of oaths that occurred at it, with Charles swearing in the language of Louis, old German, and Louis swearing in the language of Charles, the ancestor of French. As so often, this event was the product of political necessity, and this occasion the need for Charles and Louis to deal with the vexatious ambitions of their eldest brother uh, in the overall context of the fragmentation of the empire knitted together by their grandfather, uh, Charlemagne. Now the exchange of oaths at Strasbourg strikes me as relevant as we stand at the threshold of another divisio imperii. It seems to me that we need a bilingualism of the intellect and a capacity for intellectual sympathy quite as much as a practical bilingualism or the formal ability to understand. So I want to juxtapose the EU model, Luxembourg, and the Council of Europe model, Strasbourg. Uh, not only is Strasbourg a remarkably resonant lieu de mémoire in European history, but the Council of Europe model is a model which seems to sit much more easily with the historic currents of international law and the lived experience of cooperation between nations. And there is a tendency sometimes, I think, to regard the existence and excellence of the European Union as articles in some theological creed. But the EU is not a church, a new version of the Athanasian Creed requires belief in four sacred institutions, court, council, parliament, and commission. No more is Brexit a matter of scientific proof or a theological credendum. Brexit and its aftermath, if it ever becomes possible to speak of an aftermath, are matters for argument, for dialogue, for conclusions, for interim conclusions, or indeed for conclusions that uh, we, we, we know may be uh, adjusted at some stage in the future, but we have to stick to them now. Um, and we know that all of these are little more than opinions that may be weighed in truth for their value, not by us, but perhaps by the children of our grandchildren. Thank you very much.